Thanks so much for coming to the Liverpool launch of Comradeology. Um, I'm Becky, the co-editor of the anthology, and I just wanted to quickly say a few thank yous because we've had loads of different partners and uh, it's been a really amazing project. Um, the first big thank you is to the uh, Polish Cultural Institute in London. Um, Magda Rosinska, the um, head of literature there, is the, um, my co-editor and they've been a massive support um, on the project and it was actually Magda's idea who approached us, uh, Comma Press. So yeah, we're the publisher and we're based in Manchester. Uh, we're an independent publisher of predominantly short fiction, which makes us a little bit niche, but um, we champion the short story um, basically in pretty much everything that we do and we really like working on translated projects as well, such as this. Um, I also want to say thank you to the British Council um, who have supported us and also the um, Polish Book Institute um, who um, helped us with the translations. Um, and yeah, so as you can kind of hear, it's a real kind of mesh of British and Polish. And in that sense, it's already a kind of excellent testament to Comrade in terms of the very kind of fibres of the anthology. Um, so. In a minute, I'll pass over to Robert to kind of introduce the event and to introduce our other speakers, but um, just a little bit about the anthology. Um, so as well as these amazing writers um, from near and far, um, we've got uh, Camilla Shamsi, Paul Theroux, uh, Jacek Dukai, who's a uh, leading Polish um, science fiction writer, uh, SJ Bradley from Leeds, um, and yet, yeah, I really encourage you to buy the book and explore Joseph Conrad with us um, in the 21st century. But yeah, I'll hand over to Robert to look after the event. Thank you. What I'll do is I will chair the event, but I thought I'd give a brief introduction to Conrad, first of all, and then also to the anthology and the readers tonight. Um, some decades ago, I was in Liverpool visiting my mother, who'd had a bad fall, and was in the Royal Liverpool Hospital. <laughs> When I left the ward, I looked back, and there on the wall was a plaque about the surgeon after whom the ward was named, uh, Sir Robert Jones. Um, Robert Jones was a Welsh orthopaedic surgeon who was a pioneer of orthopaedic surgery. Uh, he was also an early exponent of the use of x-rays for surgery, surgical purposes. More to the point for this evening, he was the surgeon who operated on Conrad's wife, Jessie. Um, Jessie had a bad fall, damaged both her kneecaps, and had problems for the rest of her life as a result of that. In December 1919, Conrad spent a month in Liverpool while her knees were being operated on by Sir Robert Jones. Uh, they stayed in Kingsley Road in Prince's Park, and then after the operation, Jesse stayed in Huskisson Street in order to recuperate. Um, this wasn't Conrad's first contact with Liverpool. He'd been in Liverpool briefly in 1916 as part of his wartime service, and Liverpool also features occasionally in his fiction. Um, in his short story, Youth, for example, he describes the crew of the Judea as recruited from what he calls Liverpool hard cases, whatever he means by that. Uh, he praises them for their ability to work with impressive self-discipline in critical moments and their appreciation of the beauty of seamanship. It was something in them, something inborn and subtle and everlasting, he writes. But it has to be said that the actual crew of the Palestine, the ship that he, that he was on, uh, with whom he served, actually didn't have any Liverpudlians. Um, it consisted of five Cornishmen, and the rest were all uh, uh, foreigners. In his novel, Lord Jim, the incident on, incident on board the training ship at the start of the novel, where a coaster has collided with a schooner at anchor, obviously takes place in the Mersey, although it's not, the Mersey is not named. In Lord Jim and other works, Conrad has caused to refer to Conway boys. This is obviously where these people were, uh, where Jim is being trained. He's alluding to the naval training ship, HMS Conway, uh, which was moored off Rock Ferry. In July 1920, in response to a letter from the Liverpool shipping firm, the Ocean Steamship Company, Conrad produced his, quote, memorandum for the scheme of fitting out a sailing ship for the purpose of perfecting the training of merchant service officers belonging to the port of Liverpool. So another Liverpool connection, if not the sharpest of titles. As many of you probably know, Conrad was born Josef Theodor Konrad Korsunovsky in Berdichev in what is now the Ukraine in December 1857. So he's just celebrated his 160th birthday, uh, which is part of the reason for the year of Konrad, which, which has occupied all of this year. His parents were members of the Schlachter, which is the Polish gentry, 
but there were also active Polish nationalists at a time when Poland didn't exist and was occupied by Russia, Prussia, and Austria. In 1862, his parents were sentenced to exile by the Tsarist authorities for their political activities. And the whole family then spent the next few years in northern Russia, in the, equi the equivalent of being sent to Siberia. By 1869, both his parents were dead. Um, his mother had died of TB during the early years of this period, and his father was, uh, also had TB and died as well. Five years later, in 1874, the 16-year-old Conrad left Poland for Marseille and the start of his life in the Merchant Navy. Uh, he had to get out of Poland, or out of Russia as it then was, because otherwise he was liable to 25 years service in the ranks of the Russian army, uh, which was not an attractive prospect for lots of reasons. During his life at sea, he'd visited the Caribbean, India, Southeast Asia, and Australia. And he'd also perhaps most famously visited the Congo. He became a naturalized British subject in 1886. He published his first novel, Almer's Folly, in 1895. And over the next 30 years, he published a succession of novels and novelle, Heart of Darkness, Lord Jim, Nostromo, The Secret Agent, Under Western Eyes, Chance, Victory, uh, The Rover, and so on and also a range of stories and essays. From the start, his work was well received critically, but he didn't achieve popular success until he published Chance early in 1914. He made his name, first of all, as a writer about Southeast Asia. He was described in one review of Almer's Folly as the Kipling of the Malay archipelago. Then he became known as a writer about ships and the sea, with stories like Typhoon and The End of the Tether, for example. But with Heart of Darkness in 1900, set in Africa, he revealed his anti-colonialism and his exposure of the hypocrisy of the rhetoric of a, of a civilizing mission. And in Nostromo of 1905, set in South America, he published his great novel exposing neo-colonialism, American imperialism, and globalization, or what we now think of as globalization. In his next two novels, The Secret Agent and Under Western Eyes, he explored anarchist circles in London, political refugees, and the policing of political dissidents, and then revolutionaries in Russia and the conditions of Russian autocracy. So Conrad then is a serious novelist engaging with issues which are still relevant to us today. At the same time, saying just this doesn't do justice to Conrad's achievement as a novelist. As Ngugi says in the current issue of the New York Review of Books, reading under Western eyes broke him away from the linear plots and single viewpoint of his early fiction and turned him towards the multiple narrative voices and diverse temporal spaces of his later fiction. In addition to Conrad's great sophistication in the handling of narrative, there's also the issue of his writing style. To quote Ngugi again, the majesty and musicality of his well-structured sentences are enough to cure a bout of writer's block. At least that was Ngugi's experience. And Ngugi ends by acknowledging Conrad as, quote, one of us, a literary brother to a chebi both the victims of empire, both non-native speakers who embraced English for their creative work. Tonight we have three fiction writers who've responded to this year of Joseph Conrad and engaged with Conrad and his work in, in different ways. Uh, the first one is Sarah Schofield, who teaches creative writing at Edge Hill University. She was the winner of the Writers Inc. Short Story Competition and the Cordell Short Story Competition and has been, has been included in other comma press anthologies, uh, Lemistry, biopunk, beta life, and so on. And she's currently working on her first collection of short fiction. Secondly, we have uh, Grazinia Lovanek, um, who's a highly acclaimed and best-selling novelist, uh, the author of such works as Box of Stilettos, 2002, Girls from Portofino, 2005, A Girl Called Prisius Tupa of 2007, and most recently, Ill Illegal Liaisons. And then finally, we have Wojciech uh, Olinsky, a Warsaw-born journalist and writer who's a regular columnist for Gazeta by Boscia. He originally trains a chemist, and he's both a writer of science fiction and a critic of science fiction. His publications include What are Sepulchki, All About Lem, All About Lem, 2007. That is Stanisław Lem, the famous Polish writer. And uh, Wojciech has also written Lem's biography and a travel book, America Does Not Exist of 2010. So I'll hand over now to Sarah. Um, so I'm going to read a, a short extract from uh, the story that I wrote for this anthology. It's called Expectant Management. 
Um, I'm not going to start right at the beginning, so I'll just give you a little uh, run-in. As to, to, to give you some grounding, uh, it's about a woman who's newly appointed as a head teacher in a, a failing school, a kind of super head. Um, she's new to the area, she doesn't have a support network, her partner's away, her family don't live locally, and she has a miscarriage. Um, I based... I, the story I was using to kind of inspire me particularly was The Secret Sharer. Um, and if you're familiar with that story, uh, you'll know that um, Lagat kind of appears at a critical moment for the protagonist, um, for the captain in, in that story. And I kind of wanted to emulate that with mine, uh, with, with my protagonist. And she has a similar visitor uh, who appears. Uh, and in this extract, uh, we're going to see um, her uh, emerge appear for the first time. Um, at this point in the story, our character Jess is really just trying to keep going under a lot of pressure um, and she hasn't sort of shared with anybody uh, what she's going through um, and how she's sort of dealing with everything psychologically and emotionally and physically. Um, so this is, this is from Expectant Management. Clutching your laptop, you stride out onto your apartment balcony, gasping for air. The sea breeze is abrasive and you close your eyes as it tingles across your skin. The sound of the waves meeting the shore is soothing and you imagine what it would be like to have nothing to tether you. No responsibility to anyone tomorrow. You rest the laptop on the edge of the balcony. It seesaws on the narrow ledge and you loosen your grip fractionally. The weight of the laptop tilts, then a moment later it slips from between your fingers. You keep your eyes closed and there is an expectant pause before it smashes onto the pavement. You feel a momentary thrill, looking over the balcony to the broken laptop below, lying in the gutter like mechanical roadkill. Then you look at your hands, trembling, recklessly weightless, and you stuff them in your pockets. Your heart races and it is like starting from a dream. You shudder and look far out to the lonely horizon. You reason with yourself, it's only a laptop, it's mostly backed up, you can buy a new one. When you look back down, there is someone leaning over the laptop, bending so that they appear headless. The figure straightens and looks up at you. When you get down to the street, the person is still there, an older woman, perhaps in her 70s, broad and round like a cottage loaf. She has coarse white hair that sits shapelessly on her head and the whisper of a moustache on her lip. She wears a calf-length coat over a blue-flowered dress. She observes as you gather together the laptop, then follows you back into the building. She grips the banister, methodically climbing the stairs. You leave her to it. You sit down at the dining table with the laptop pieces and you listen and wait. A couple of minutes later, she comes in and sits on the sofa. You try to piece the laptop back together and the woman watches. The old woman is still there a few days later. She potters silently, smoking cigarettes that smell like burnt toffee. Gaulois, you think, knowing you're drawing this from old films and dramas that you've seen. You feel slightly disappointed that your imagination couldn't have created someone more outlandish or dynamic. I could have invented someone attractive, you think at her, as she passes you and raises an eyebrow. The old woman sits on the balcony and knits something lumpy on a huge pair of needles. She unravels and re-knits the thing over and over. Her moustache is sometimes covered with a layer of bleaching cream. She is Breton. You don't know how you know this, but you do. You must have come from somewhere, you think the words at her, and she smiles knowingly. But I don't, you don't have to stay long, I'm fine on my own. The woman has a bottle beside her, and it is always two-thirds full. You think it is probably Eau de Vie. Saturday, a parcel arrives from your mother, a large beef prime rib. It is cold and moist inside the poly polystyrene container. The label stuck to the side of the box says, nicer than liver, love M, kiss. You sit heavily on the sofa, and the woman sits beside you. A gap yawns open in your abdomen where the pain once was and you hug the cool beef rib against it. You shut your eyes. When you wake, the meat is warm from the heat of your body. There's an iron tang in the air. 
there's a bloody stain on the sofa. Thank you. Finish there. Mm. I was going to comment on the relations between that and the Conrad story. Yeah. It was very interesting that you pick up on the idea of secret sharing, but in two different ways, in yeah. ways that are not quite clear from what you've read this evening. So one secret sharer is the, is the woman, who yes. <laughs> might or might not be imaginary, yes. which is also the case in some ways in the Conrad story. Yeah. But there's also another secret sharer as well, isn't it, which didn't quite come out in the extract you read. What are you referring mis- to? Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I'm not quite sure what you're... Sorry, um, because there's also the story of the miscarriage. Yes, of yeah. course, yeah, yeah, As absolutely. another kind of secret sharing. Yes, absolutely. I think it was the case that I, I wanted to create a vehicle for this woman to um, explore her emotions um, through um, this kind of imaginary person. I, it's, it is quite different in some ways to secret sharer because I think it's far more enigmatic whether the uh, legat, legat in, in secret share is actually real or not. Um, I'd be interested to know how you feel about that. I personally feel that he, yeah, I think he is real, um, but it is an open thing, isn't it? Whereas the the secret share in my um, in my story uh, is 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 very much imaginary. Yeah. Um, but it seemed like a gift to to make that to draw that comparison um, with um, the the sort of the person that is both there and not there mm-hmm. um, and, and with miscarriage you, you're dealing with something that is both there and not there and it was um, a parallel that I really wanted to explore mm-hmm. in that way and that idea of um, you know the future potential of somebody that then is never there but is there um, I kind of wanted to play around with that idea and explore it um, mm-hmm. in a way that didn't feel too heavy or onerous to the actual subject matter which mm-hmm. can be it's quite a traumatic thing to to read about really and I, mm-hmm. I you sort of aware that you don't want to be insensitive to the reader if it's something that they um, that they perhaps have gone yeah. through or experienced. Yeah. That actually, it was quite a good vehicle to um, explore that idea. Yeah. Yeah. And there's also ways in which that's present in the story because the story is also about people in confined spaces. Yes. And the kind of yes. the release of uh, Leggett is also yeah. kind of birth as well. Absolutely, absolutely, and and this idea that um, you know. I don't know if people here have experiences within uh, teaching within schools or, or um, colleges, universities. There's often um, so much pressure on um, on the education system these days that it can feel incredibly um, like you are. You know, all the cliches, all at sea. Um, you know, tight, keeping a tight ship. All those things really kind of play into that environment, and it it just felt very paralleled to me. Um, uh, for, and for her to just not have that outlet to. Um, to be able to not be able to do her job for a while, yeah. Because um, yeah. it's also a story of first command and the problem yes. of first command. Absolutely. So it fits nicely with your headmistress. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Are there any other comments on the extract you heard or questions for Sarah? Um, so when you're writing a story inspired by another author, yeah. is, are there sort of key aspects that you want to grab before you sort of set that aside and concentrate on your own? Definitely. I think that's a really, really good question. Um, the way I actually um, structured the story was I, I went, I, I read a, a great, great deal of Conrad's work again, reread a lot of a lot of stories and then honed in on the secret share. Then I lifted 10 moments through the story as kind of my scaffold, effectively, moments that felt key um, to the original t- uh, text um, that then interwove onto, onto the fabric of my story um, so actually there are quite a few uh, phrases, sentences, words that are either the same or, or slightly twisted um, from the original uh, to, to kind of uh, to, to mirror onto that story. Um, yeah, and, and certain themes that I wanted to draw out, so the kind of duality of um, private versus public and uh, rational, irrational. Um, I wanted to, to draw draw those out a little bit, but through my own narrative, um, they felt really important to the to the to the text, the original text, and the feel of the text as well. Yeah. We'll move on to Virginia. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Okay. So this is this is a story. Uh, which takes place in an imaginary country uh, where the majority in parliament are women. 
And uh, so I have two protagonists. One is uh, called Mama Fatumata, one is called Mama Scholastica. Now we'll go to, this is the, the beginning of the story and this is the kind of monologue, internal monologue of uh, Mama Fatumata. The title is Mamas. Mama Fatumata felt a warm trickle of sweat drip from under her wig. She wiped it away with an impatient movement of her hand and smacked her lips. This didn't change the look of disapproval on her face. Mama Fatumata didn't like to smile. She didn't think it was appropriate for a working woman, a mother of six, a politician whose career was now hanging by a thread. Why? For a reason so stupid that she tatted it again, because of a lack of men. Everything always starts with a scuffle. Who is taller? Who is bigger? Who's richer? Whose cock is bigger? And, is, and if one couldn't return to the ancient practice of sharing. In the old days, when a man went out into the fields, his father, brother or uncle might pay his wife a visit while he was gone. <coughs> The man would drive his spear into the ground in front of the threshold as a signal, do not enter. And the husband would wait outside until his relative had finished having intercourse with his wife. What was wrong with that? It's how marriages were within the clans, so that property wouldn't be divided. A cock is a cock, no matter what nationality or ethnicity is written in the man's ID document. Ethnicity. What a word. As if people were born different. Mama Fatumata had given birth to six children and had raised over a dozen more. She knew, without a doubt, that any apparent differences between people were insignificant. Unless, of course, there is an albino involved. Everything turned ugly because of all the divisions. Separate boxes, labels, and all that's hair splitting. And how? People raged and stormed, clashed and lashed each other, drank each other's blood, and bit off each other's cocks. But all these dumb cocks were exactly the same. Mama Fatumata scratched her forehead, but it didn't bring her any relief. Bits of sweat had formed furrows in her face powder, and were now washing away the remaining layers of makeup coating her skin, threatening her carefully drawn drawn on eyebrows. The idea of legalizing polygamy was as risky nowadays as it was revolutionary. It's not as if it were something new. People had lived that way for ages. But at a certain point, the continuity had been broken. A new master and a new god had entered, breaking the continuity like a drop of sweat smudging the black arch of an eyebrow. Monogamy was introduced. One mo woman, one man. Because that's what the foreign god wanted. And because it supposedly prevented AIDS. But how could it really prevent it, since there has never been a single man since the world began who's been able to have sex with only one woman for his whole life? And no woman could promise herself to just one man. Well, she could. But keeping her word is a different matter. <laughs> yes, Conrad is not known for his writing about polygamy, but we were discussing <laughs> last, we were discussing last night uh, yes. the way in which your work is responding to the absence of or the role of women characters in Heart of Darkness. I wonder if you want to say more about that. Yes, I mean polygamy and the subject of polygamy is not. Um, uh, something very Conrad-like, no. but uh, women or the absence of women in the heart of darkness, there is something uh, uh, that, that I found in, in Conrad, heart of darkness, really. Uh, so that's why I was, I was inspired uh, to create a world where, uh, where women can decide about different matters. Uh, and even though polygamy is considered as something uh, not very feminist, mm. but uh, once they have power, mm. they have voice, they can speak, they can decide. So that's why I was thinking of creating a world uh, where at least women have voices, no matter what, what they will do with this, mm. uh, whether the decisions will be smart or 
uh, not really, uh, but they debate. So uh, this is the, the beginning of this parliament uh, fight, I might say. Which is largely women. There's only about 17 men, I think, out there in the parliament and the rest are... Yes, this is the parliament really uh, dominated by, by women. So I think there is 70 something women and 17 uh, men. So mm. it's really... Uh, dominated by, by, by women. And this was partly because in Heart of Darkness there were, what, five women? Yes, in the Heart of Darkness I was fascinated <coughs> by the lack of voice, mm. uh, female voices. Mm. Mm. And uh, of course we discussed it um, and uh, there are other Conrad's um, books, uh, novels, where women speak and uh, one of one of them is uh, Almayer's Folly, my, my favorite book uh, of, of Conrad. Uh, so, of course, women, women speak, but in the Heart of Darkness, uh, there, are, uh, there is the aunt who, who you, you can't say that she speaks because she conveys some stereotypes. Um, there, is, um, there are two uh, old women. I, I, I was sure that maybe one of them was inspiration for your story as well, for this, because there are two women who are fates, you know, mythological fates, uh, but they don't talk uh, as well. And there is also a black woman. Uh, she's completely a sexual object and, uh, and she has no voice, no, no words even. Uh, and then there is this fiance uh, of of Kurz, uh, and she she also she's like a construct of, of naive romantic uh, uh, character without her own without her own character in fact. So that's why I was I was uh, inspired or provoked to 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 write <laughs> about really strong uh, female characters uh, to 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 give them strong voices and uh, so in the, later on they fight they they, they fight with each other as yeah. well so yeah. this is really the uh, dynamic uh, scenario so in this case conrad is the provocation rather than the model yes i would yeah. say in this case i mean the heart of darkness uh, yes. yes because this is this is the book that i reread uh, yeah. recently and and that struck me the most because of course colonialism as you said and it was we discussed before uh, this is the obvious um, thing that now we we, we don't even uh, discuss with, with with this, but this lack of lack of female voices. It was in Conrad's prose, but then later on as well uh, in 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 many books. Um, so that's why I was thinking, um, yeah, why not uh, let them shout? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Any other comments or questions for Presinia? I'm just wondering, given the, the current situation in Poland, that women's voices are perhaps not being heard with, around the, the issue of abortion. It seemed to be some progress is made, but now it looks like the Polish government is coming back yes. at women, and so I'm just interested in women's voices in Poland at the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's a very it's a great question because I think this this story short story was was inspired as well by the situation. I was also involved as an activist to uh, a year ago um, uh, because we organized black marches against uh, against this project of of, of a law uh, that was uh, about to be introduced. So it was almost introduced. This this was a project that could forbid women uh, to have an abortion. Completely. Now we have three cases, uh, so it was it was a project that that uh, could could um, make it impossible, even if it would be a case of rape or, or uh, uh, deformation or something like this. So that's why, um, as you know, uh, women went on on streets in Poland. So it was I think one one hundred thousand of women, and. Um, in other cities as well, so I co-organized co uh, a march in, in Brussels. Um, and right now, so the, then the, the, the government uh, backed off for, for a year, but I think right now the situation is not uh, stable in that case. Uh, and of course there were other small movements like they uh, withdrew from, from pharmacies this uh, pill uh, after uh, the day after it's called, right? Oh, so, day after pill. Yeah, so there, there are small, you know, actions that uh, we we have to we, we observe, of course, but uh, but we we do not demonstrate right now. But 
it's still it's still very, very unstable. Yes, thank you for the question because it's not that well known, uh, but it's the reality right now. In that case, we'll move on to the third reader, and we'll take over to you. So, actually, following up your your question, uh, uh, when I was invited to this project, there was you, you could also hear the the kind of language that scared me and still scares me. In, in my country, you know, there, there are actual politicians and people in the mainstream media who are using the kind of language like they talk about racial purity, like I'm not making it up. So, so, so that was occupying my mind when I was invited to this project, and that's by probably my my my. My reasoning went this way, like t talking about colonialism right now when you hear that on, on your TV. And one of the key um, concepts, mythos of, uh, myths of, 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 of uh, colonialism is the white, man, white man's burden. So I imagine the post-apocalyptic -post science fiction story in which the, the white race is entirely uh, eradicated. There's, there are no, no, no white people anymore. And uh, as such, uh, Poland is uh, almost entirely depopulated. Actually, it's grown by, 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 by forests. Uh, and and uh, so, so, so I, I imagine that in, in, in such case, uh, the Catholic Church, or what's left of it, will, will do like in the Middle Ages, that like we create a special brotherhood, special order to protect the pilgrims uh, wandering through those wastelands. And uh, so that's why I got the, the general image of, 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 of post-apocalyptic Warsaw in which this story takes, uh, takes place. Uh, the main protagonist is going to the Joseph Conrad Street, which actually exists and where I spent my childhood. Uh, and uh, and uh, because most of these, uh, these uh, brothers from this brotherhood, they, are, they, are, they, are, they come from, from Africa or Latin America, and they are using, uh, I imagine, this special vehicles uh, made by Brazilian company Embraer. That's how I got it uh, for, for some reason. And they, they are w w walking machines because you cannot drive through, through, through streets or roads because they are blocked by, by wrecks and wreckage, debris and what else. So, so and another reason, so I, 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 I also don't want to read the whole story. I will, I will bring you at some end, end part of this, of this journey to, to, to Joseph Conrad Street. Because I felt that you know Joseph Conrad is one of the of many in the whole uh, chain of, of Polish people who are making the, the best career move in their life by moving out <laughs> of Poland. So also my character did that, but then for some reason he's going back to this apocalyptic world. But I won't tell you the reason. Okay, so <clears throat> on to reading. We were in Krasinski Street. That much I could still remember from the city's geography. As per the plan laid out a hundred years earlier, a green strip ran down the center, now covered by tall birch trees. The dead windows of abandoned buildings gazed at us from both sides. The Embraer stepped gracefully over cars left behind in the middle of the road by dying drivers. At the intersection with Popiewuszko Street, there were more cars than elsewhere. I guess that a tram must have hit a bus here, and then cars and the lorry piled up on top. The vehicles were heavily corroded and overgrown with greenery. Brother Jorge must have seen my expression as I took it all in. It was the only time he spoke during, during the whole journey. There are places that look even worse. The ring road is maybe the worst of all. I nodded. I had heard on the radio about the pileup on the ring road when it happened. That was two days after the outbreak. At first, the tone of the news reports was almost jokey. A sleeping epidemic. Haha, <laughs> maybe we should party a bit less. Then we heard about the first casualties, and then about the gigantic pileup on the ring road. And after that, that was the most frightening of all, all the Polish radio stations simply stopped transmitting. My cable connection went too, and with it, the internet. The last news reports advised people not to go out, so I didn't. It was only when I picked up the BBC on an old shortwave radio that I found out that the, find out that the epidemic wasn't lethal to everyone, that it affected only certain haplospecific groups. It took me a while to figure out that this politically correct euphemism meant the Caucasian race, and that, and that I was safe thanks to my Cuban DNA. It's, it's explained. The Embraer brought us to Broniewski Street. We left Jolibosch, where pre-war middle-class mansions blocked, lined, blocks lined the road with their dignified frontages, and entered the world of large estates built in 1960s, according to the utopian vi visions of Le Corbusier. He had dreamt about skyscrapers set among gardens. Here were ruins lost in a birch wood growing rapidly all around us. Thankfully, I didn't have to see the ring road. It crossed Pronieski Street on a flyover. The Embraer lowered its cabin and walked under the viaduct, 
like a camel passing through a gate of ancient Jerusalem. At the end of Broniewski Street, we turned into Raymond Street, crossing from poetry to prose, which led us to Conrad Street. When Poland regained its independence at the end of the First World War, the new roads were named after 19th century romantic poets, Mickiewicz, Słowacki, and Krasiński, who had prophesied that independence. These roads converged at Wilson Square, named after the American president to whom Poland owned that independence. Broniewski Street, built later, during the communist era, was named after the poet who has prophesied the egalitarian people's Poland, where everybody would live in identical flats in identical blocks. And, the, and when Warsaw expanded to the north in the 1970s, it was trendy to emphasize our links with the West, to which we were opening up and which readily offered us loans. That's why the last street in this series was named after Joseph Conrad. And after the fall of communism, streets were named after generals or priests. They were no longer named after writers. <laughs> the Church of Mary Help of Christians was an architectural eyesore from the 1990s. The communist authorities hadn't made the provision for it in their plans, so the faithful found an unused plot of land at the corner of Raymond and Conrad, a nationalist and a cosmopolitan. Would they have liked each other if they met in real life? The Brotherhood has surrounded the church with a steel fence of the same sort I'd already seen in Wilson Square. Wilson Square. In addition, a low razor wire barrier ran a few meters in front of it. When the Embraer stopped just before the barrier, I read one of the multilingual signs warning about the presence of an automatic security system, danger of death, peligro mortal. The warnings were clearly true, as evidenced by the bodies of animals who hadn't read the signs. <laughs> One of the things that struck me hearing you read that was how brilliantly you used the streets, the street plan of Warsaw, to give a potted history of 20th century Poland. Mm -hmm. um, when, I, I was also, because the, the history of Poland is also a kind of, of Warsaw at least, of recolonizing, re, recolonizing colonizing yourself, I would put it this way, because, uh, because when Poland wasn't on, ma on the map, uh, the Tsarist authorities were blocking the, 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 the growth of the city. And, the, the, and there were some kind of shanty town appeared uh, on, on, the, on the outskirts. So it, it was inhabited by people who weren't officially there. The, the buildings were officially there. And so th there's a lot of uh, romantic leg legends about, about the people who, who lived there. And after uh, the independence, it was all you know, bulldozed or destroyed in some other way. Yes, and, and modern uh, roads were, 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 were planned. And, and uh, at least in the northern part of, of Warsaw, they are named after various generations of poets and writers who also, there are different layers of Polish cultural history. So, but uh, like in Warsaw, there, there are no longer streets. Uh, yes, that, 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 that's, true. that's true mostly for Warsaw, but in Krakow they have some streets named after writers. So, I mean, perhaps I, 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 my, my narrator is generalizing a little bit too much. But no, yeah, in, in Warsaw, the, 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 you have battles and martyrs and fighters and, and uh, activists perhaps, but no writers. No, no new writers. <laughs> Nobody after Conrad. Yeah. <laughs> one of the things we discussed last night was uh, Conrad and science fiction. In that one of Conrad's collaborations with Ford, Maddox Ford, was a work called The Inheritors, which involves a group called the Fourth Dimensionists. And it's sometimes discussed as an early work of science fiction. Mm -hmm. And one of Conrad's early reviewers and early friends was H.G. Wells. So that Conrad knew Wells gave a very favorable review of um, the uh, Almer's Folly. They met up shortly afterwards. They remained in contact from 1895 through to 1908. And Conrad had read all of <coughs> Wells' early work. Uh, there's one occasion when he visits Wells and the bell sounds, and they make a joke about the invisible man. Uh, but other science fiction writers also have responded to Conrad. Y yes, I'm so, 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 so I, the, the, I, I still don't understand why, why a short story by Stanislav Lem, which is clearly inspired by Lord Jim, wasn't. In this book, maybe you can explain that. <laughs> but but there is a there is a there is a great 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 short story titled The Inquest, and it happens during the inquest, inquiring, explaining some some strange incident in outer space, which very much resembles the, the incident described in Lord Dream, and and and. Uh, an uh, interesting thing about, about Lem is that uh, he, his reading con of Conrad was uh, slightly different than the one you, you, you'll find here, the, the reading of Jan Józef Szczepanski, his great friend. Uh, but uh, so, 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 so Lem has seen, uh, I, would, I would say perhaps using a, a anachronistic language, but, 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 but what Lem saw so, so in Conrad is a study of, of 
alienation if in, uh, in corporate capitalism. That's I would he describe his reading, which is completely absent in this in this in this story of Jan Józef Czapanski, who had so the honor and faithfulness and completely different set. Of, it's all there actually. You know, great literature have be ha has to have more than one layer, actually, like almost by by definition. So 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 yes. Yeah, so 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 Lem has find something else in in, in Conrad and uh, and. So I, 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 and I also try to try to try to try to um, go an entirely different way in this, in this, with this, with this whole topic of racism and colonialism by you know, perversely reversing it. Like yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there's yeah. no no white race anymore, and the world seems to be quite content. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's obvious ways in which Conrad's sea stories can be transferred into spaceships. Mm? Um, Actually, it's 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 surprisingly easy. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, I mean, I mean, uh, Conrad in many ways was a was a prophet. Like 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 he he was a very keen observer of of civilization, and he has uh, he was. Profoundly right in his uh, skepticism about where, where he's going to, like, uh, like, uh, you know, you know, people in the late 19th century. Well, I, I, I'm talking stereotypes right now, but some people in Great Britain truly believed in Great British Empire, which will bring some, civilization. Some people still do. Uh, <laughs> everywhere else, yes, <laughs> the British ex exception, exceptionalists. Yeah. And, and so he didn't yeah. believe yeah. that. He has seen this firsthand in, in this worst part. Like you know, he was observing from the bottom, from yeah. just a yeah. humble yeah. seaman who is actually observing. What are we bringing to those other nations, and what are we taking them back? So he he never bought it. So, yeah. so he's so so so, and he was true. Like like he was right. Like that's yeah yeah. Because I could pursue that a bit further with you. Because okay. one of the interesting works on is Nostromo, which mm -hmm. I mentioned earlier. I don't know whether you no. you know that uh, Nostromo came into my mind through a loop because I was thinking about aliens mm -hmm. and the spaceship in Aliens is, is the Nostromo. Mm -hmm. uh, but so Nostromo came in while you were talking. Um, but Nostromo is very much responding to the war between America and Spain. Mm -hmm. uh, so at the, the end of the 19th century, Ameri the America takes on the, the kind of de declining Spanish empire and takes it over. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's the, Sp the Spanish-American War. Conrad was, and his friend Cunningham Graham were very concerned about this, and there's a correspondence between them about this. And um, Conrad talked about the Yankee conquistadores mm -hmm. as his account of what what America is doing, in, in a sense, foretelling mm -hmm. the 20th century as the American century. Mm -hmm. And what Nostromo does is create this fictional South American country. And people like um, Marquette and others have responded to this. Uh, this fictional country, which is a composite of various of Uruguay, Paraguay, and so on, but what sets it off is the story of the Panama Canal, uh, which was that the, um, the, American, the French had wanted to build a Panama Canal and that had failed. And then the Ameri an American company wanted to build a Panama mm -hmm. Canal, but Colombia wouldn't, wouldn't allow them to do this. So there then rose up a, a secessionist movement in Panama, who declared Panama independent from Colombia. And American warships were there ready to support the new country. Mm -hmm. And the new country gave them a contract to build the canal they wanted. And this was something that Conrad, knew, Conrad and Cunningham Grant talk about. And this is part of the origin of Nostromo, because Nostromo then is about this America, South American country, about its penetration by European capital in the form of mm -hmm. railroads, telegraphs, mm -hmm. mining companies, and so on. But also there's a, a conflict then between European colonization of that country and an American financier who's financing the, the silver mine. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of core for that, mm -hmm. that narrative. Mm -hmm. As a, Picking up what you were saying about mm -hmm. Conrad as mm -hmm. prophetic and mm -hmm. his awareness of these kind of historical developments. So th there's also this story that uh, Farah was, was reading uh, yesterday. Yeah. It's, uh, it's about how tourism is, is not as innocent as we yeah. might think. Like we might think that you know, tourism is good because, because they need our money and we need entertainment, so we go there and, but you know, it's, it's not such, it's not so good like, like yeah. this, this described this in, in, in her short story that yeah. having an economy which is dependent on entertaining completely different people from different countries, not, it's actually yeah. not, not yeah. as brilliant. So, 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 so again, I, I, I think this is, this is one of these, the, Key questions of 20th century that mm. white man's civilization was of bringing things that are apparently good, like railroads and, and tourists and, and money, but we, we ended up in a world which is not, not so good, actually. <laughs> One of the questions last night was which is your favorite Conrad story? So I came to run 
in a sense, you, you've partly answered that, but you have other favorites as well. Mm -hmm. uh, which was your favorite Conrad story? Mine. We yeah. start, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, like I said, the uh, Almayer's folly mm. is something that I that I admire really, mm. because of uh, the uh, the emotions. Uh, I mean, he really talks about um, about about uh, strong feelings of paternity, for example. Mm. This mm. is uh, the father mm. uh, that we see, mm. and the father. Um, uh, his name is he's a Dutch guy. What yeah. is his uh, name? Olmer. Exactly. Casper yeah. uh, Olmer. Mm -hmm. So he he's he's uh, he's a father who uh, loves his daughter and he wants the best for her, mm. but uh, he has all these cultural constructions in in his head. Um, mm. In fact, he's um, he's racist, uh, mm. even though he uh, he has um, a wife, Malaysian wife, and his daughter is m mixed. So uh, he kind of uh, falls in a trap of this of this uh, construction of this of this cultural construction. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, what, what what I read in this story is really the deep love of, of the father for for his daughter, mm -hmm. and the same with the mother because the mother also wants her to to yeah. uh, her best. Uh, so f for me, it's a really um, I mean this is the analyze not only about uh, of Almayer mm -hmm. and his folly uh, in that sense. Um, in fact, it's he's 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 really divided. He's deeply divided between between uh, his instinct that he doesn't believe in his instinct and his duties, and he really believes in his duties. So that's why he's really mm -hmm. the folly comes from that uh, mm -hmm. for me. Uh, and, but but also you know um, we can still ad identify with uh, with these characters because they are um, existentially speaking they are mm -hmm. us uh, mm -hmm. now even. And there's the conflict the daughter faces then with her mother and father having quite different mm -hmm. uh, cultural backgrounds and quite different ambitions yes. for her. Exactly. I was thinking that. interesting because I'm because I live in Brussels for twelve mm -hmm. years right now. So uh, you know the integration, so-called the mm -hmm. cultural integration. Mm -hmm. I have it every day, and we, I, my, my friends are from really different backgrounds. We are all from from really different countries, continents. We we speak different languages, and mm -hmm. we have different memories from childhood. Uh, yeah. We we saw different stories. We heard different songs for for to, to fall asleep, you know, yeah. and. Um, so uh, of course there is a question about uh, the integration. Whether is is it possible or not? In even in big cities like uh, mm -hmm. like Brussels, London, or I mean, to, how we can we can do this? How we can work this? Uh, and, yeah. and here, sorry, in this uh, Almayer's folly, we have really the microcosmos of of the family, mm -hmm. where they both come with the with the background. They mm -hmm. both come with certain habits and uh, ideas. What's yeah. the best for the child? Yeah. Yeah. So I think this is very um, uh, something that we should read now. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's also an interesting question about language as well, because the, the opening words of the novel are Kaspar Makan. Mm -hmm. And so what you get, you've got a title, Almeas Folly, where it's a Dutch, Dutch surname. The word folly is probably used partly in the French sense of madness. Mm -hmm. um, and then the first two words of the novel are a, another Dutch name and a word of, of Malay, spoken by a woman for whom Malay is a second language. Her first yes. language is Sulu. So you've got a very complicated linguistic situation right at mm -hmm. the start of the novel. And that also speaks to Conrad's own kind of linguistic skills, mm -hmm. complexities. Yes, and also, as we discussed yesterday, mm. they are not with you, but I discussed with somebody we that, did, yes. that the Conrad, uh, the, what fascinates me really in, in, in Conrad's biography mm. is that um, uh, born as a Polish uh, writer uh, later, but born as a Pole, um, he uh, emigrated to, uh, to, to France at the beginning, mm. and he spoke French uh, much better than he spoke English, yeah. but he never wrote in French. Uh, yeah. But he always wrote in um, in English. Mm. So uh, you know this how how the brain works uh, yeah. and what what is this integration really? Where where is his um, home? Probably yeah. in some language, but yeah. in case of Conrad, it would be probably English. Uh, mm. I think, although he was very patriotic and he even refused, I think, for some point. Um, he was often knighthood and turned yes, it down. Yes, and he yeah. even refused, so he yeah. felt like he was Polish, but uh, I'm not sure he he was writing Polish at the end of of no. his life. Uh, so he's, you know, um, 
his home, uh, his his uh, his country uh, was somewhere in between, probably. Yeah. The very late novel, The Rover, that I mentioned, is quite interesting because it's about mm -hmm. a a sailor who comes back to the area of France where he grew up as a child. He spent his entire <laughs> life um, in the South China Seas in that area, mm -hmm. and he's come back, and it's about him coming back to a country which is not the country that he left. And a lot of it then is to do with having lived away from your own country and coming back to that country. Mm -hmm. um, and that's part of what, but the end of that story is to do with kind of mixed loyalties because he has an attachment to the English, but the timing of the novel is the war between England and France. Mm -hmm. And it, the conclusion of the story ends with him using both sides of those skills, both his English language and his French skills. So there's a kind of commitment to France and a commitment to England, kind of sim simultaneously combined in the final action that he does in the novel. Mm -hmm. So geographically speaking, uh, Conrad was also um, deeply uh, attached to uh, Bretagne, uh, mm -hmm. as you as you were. When I read your your story, I was thinking about this woman. She 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 comes from uh, from Bretagne, mm -hmm. so uh, it's also you know this. Um, Actually, he's he's drawing his own map, uh, and this is not only the map of, of geographical map because he comes from Poland to to, to France, to Bretagne, and then Brittany, uh, but also in terms of languages that he is drawing his own uh, map, um, and this is not the same. I mean, maps are different a little bit, and this is. Uh, I, I was thinking about his emotional maps. You know, yeah. there are there are emotional maps of Joseph Conrad that are. Yeah. Very interesting. Which certainly involved mm -hmm. France as well as Poland yeah. and Britain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One of the other stories you mentioned yesterday was the was Amy Foster, as it, which also picks up the question of language. This was Farah. Oh, it's Farah. Okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so I can't pick it up because I didn't no, read okay. this. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but it's it's a story about a, um, a, a man called Yankul Kural who. What is emigrating from the Carpathian Mountains, aiming to go to America, but there's a shipwreck off the Kent coast, and the he's the one survivor from the shipwreck. The description of the shipwreck and the bodies kind of being brought ashore is very like it reminds me of the kind of images we saw of things going on in the Mediterranean. But he comes ashore, and then it's about the, him the way he's mistreated to begin with because they think that he's mad, they think all kinds of things about him. Um, but eventually, there's a young woman who takes an interest in him and then marries him. But what the story then ends with is the climax of the story is to do with him. When they have a child, he wants the child to be taught his language. He wants to tell the child the songs he knew and the stories he knew. And there's a kind of rift that starts in their relationship. And it goes downhill from there. So, but I'll leave that to be found out. Mm -hmm. But again, language is very much an issue there. And the question of what it means to be a speaker of one language living in another language community which doesn't know that language is one of the issues that engages with. Sorry, mm -hmm. I've forgotten it was. No, 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 but I, uh, we were talking with Farah uh, yeah. after. Uh, so it's a kind of, you know, uh, a colonization within the family <laughs> sometimes right. because yes. with uh, with mixed couples, uh, mm -hmm. sometimes there is this problem of, of using languages and, and people fight sometimes subconsciously yes. about, uh, you know, who has bigger power <laughs> over <Yes>. kids, <laughs> linguistically speaking. Yes, yes. <laughs> What about you, which was your, Sarah? What was your... Favourite stories. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think there's there's probably two. Um, Secret Sharer is the one that I keep coming back to and keep coming back to. I think it's because the dynamic between um, the, the, the this new captain and um, Lagat, this sort of alien that aboards the ship, is so intriguing and there's so much that's unsaid. I mean, you, you see... The master at work in that between their their relate their relationship with one another, um, and you can read and reread and reread and you'll find something new each time. That was my experience of that, and I, yeah, so yeah, so Secret Sharer I think is probably my favourite, closely followed by um, Typhoon, which it's it's so immersive, and I think that for me is is very powerful. You. You're reading the story, but you feel a bit seasick. <laughs> you feel a bit overwhelmed. You kind of want to get off, but you can't because you're on this journey, and it's it's an incredible kind of rip roaring sea uh, sea tale that you that you go on. Um, 
there's all sorts in there that, that's, that's um, quite provoking in terms of, um, um, yeah, uh, the, the treatment of the people that are on the boat is, is quite, it's quite challenging. Um, but yeah, I think the, the aspect of it that I really admire is the immersiveness. And it's quite interesting that I know that um, Heart of Darkness inspired Far Cry 2, I think, the game, um, or was part of inspiration for, for Far Cry 2. And, and, and the, the references that you make to the cross kind of um, uh, referencing of, of, of uh, Conrad's work, it's just immersive, um, and, and gaming is particularly immersive. And I think, you know, you were saying about mapping and his maps that he lays out, it, it kind of goes hand in hand with that. I feel mm. that that idea of you enter the story and you are kind of exploring this world. Um, and I know, so much of his work is is from his own experience. You know that it's a tale. You know that it's a, narr a fiction, a narrative. But actually, you don't know, you don't quite know where that line is, and you don't quite know where you're crossing into territory that's that's his life, and where you're kind of crossing into territory that is his his creation. And um, I find that deeply intriguing um, yes. as a reader and as a writer. Uh, yeah. Because yeah. what's amazing is the description of the storm, isn't it? Oh my goodness, it's horrific. <laughs> it's <laughs> horrific. My dad was um, a sailor and I used to have to go on boats with him and I hate it. Um, I hate being on boats. So I think that <laughs> <laughs> it's like a pleasure pain thing reading that story yeah. for me, I think. Yeah, yeah. But the other thing that's curious is that in terms of reading and rereading is the yeah. position you take in relation to Tukes. Because on a first yeah. reading, the young, uh, this kind of smart young mate, yeah. you're tempted to agree with him and think yeah. that this captain is very dull. Yeah. But you kind of shift around oh, on beautiful. as you read and reread it. You yeah. Start. Yeah. That's it. And those personal points of the letters. It's it's yeah. It's a really beautiful piece. And yeah. 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 Nauseating at times. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. The the letters are really interesting because mm -hmm. the the captain writes letters home, mm -hmm. and his wife kind of just skim reads them. Mm -hmm. He writes these long letters, it's and there's, there's, he describes among them how he thought he was going to die on mm -hmm. this with this typhoon, mm -hmm. and she misreads it. She thinks he's threatening to come home, and she's worried that he's going to come back. And what what would she do with him if he's around the house? Yeah. There's a really awful moment, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, <coughs> and that kind of again that sort of public versus private self thing. Mm -hmm. He's this you know again captain of, of the ship and um, yeah is is just having to be this solid reliable um, slightly dull but actually incredibly complex person who yeah is just getting them through <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. so <clears throat> Uh, you mentioned you mentioned the video game as, a, yeah. as an inspiration. <laughs> Obviously, for for people from my generation, one of the most important cinematic experience was the the, the, the Heart of Darkness mm. inspired inspired by Apocalypse Now. So so yeah. so so, yeah. so yeah. This, that's another example how 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 uh, those stories well um, survived uh, until until our time. So for me, the the, the favorite part is the whole Marlowe cycle um, <laughs> because you know he's a I, I like mysteries and Marlowe is a quite a mysterious mysterious uh, figure. Like Grajina is using this uh, extremely sexist quote from The Heart of Darkness as a motto for the <laughs> <her laughs> story. And it's oh, yeah. uh, obviously it's signed Joseph Conrad. Like, you know, w women are basically stupid, Joseph Conrad. Yes. But uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's actually it. It's more Sorry. complex. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, who's actually saying these words? Is it, is it Conrad? Is it the unnamed narrator? Is it Marlowe? Or is it even somebody else? Like, you, you could argue for all, all yeah. those points. and. And and uh, and uh, the, 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 those 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 uh, heart of darkness and Lord Jim they are so well constructed. Like uh, there's a certain cynicism, a sense, sense of humor uh, in Marlowe's character. But again, is it him or is it the narrator? On who, ha who who's telling all these jokes? Like yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, you, you, you start wondering, like like this whole sexism. Whose sexism is it exactly? Yes. Like you can uh, probably somebody did wrote a very very thick book just about <laughs> just about this question. So so I I, I find them. Brilliantly constructed, and you know, it's 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 actually as you know, somebody wrote it yesterday. Yeah. Like it's, it's yeah. extremely modern. Yeah, because one of the points is that Marlowe can't get a job. He's looking for a job as a captain, mm -hmm. and it's actually that woman who gets him the job. After which he then says, "Women have no, have no understanding." So mm -hmm. there is a kind of defensiveness response on his part, where mm -hmm. he, you can see that he's putting her down because actually she got him the job mm -hmm. after he couldn't get a job. <laughs> <laughs> 
and the letters also, like the very fact that, that for, for the first part we, we think that we, we hear from everywhere that, you know, Kurt is a genius and then his letters appear and not, his manifesto, like, yeah. kill all those savages. Yes. And so, like, it's and the very is that the guy is crazy. That's, it's also, you know, very modern that you, 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 you start to realize that we are talking about a madman, not a, not a genius. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so again, again that's, that, that, I think that's... It's very that's 1890s as well. <laughs> Well, it's the island of Dr. Morrow as well, mm -hmm. the well story, mm -hmm. where it's not at all clear whether, mm -hmm. you know, is this, mm -hmm. it's that mm -hmm. the scientist is genius or madman. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. one thing we've skated over, you were talking about the, on board the typhoon, on board the Nanshan in typhoon, mm. and things that you have reservations about, to, to put it. Yeah, Do yeah. Do you want to say a bit more about that? Well, that, I think it's, it's about, um, again, as you were uh, touching on there, sort of separating out what is Conrad's mm -hmm. real opinion mm -hmm. uh, and th thoughts and feelings, and what is he presenting as the characters' thoughts mm -hmm. and feelings that the the, the the Chinese workers that mm. are um, being getting shipped back, aren't they? Yeah, they're shipped um, back. And they're in this horrendous storm, and, and they're they're just kind of cast down into the bowels of the ship, and they're being tossed and turned. And um, there's uh, uh, Jux describes the infighting between them all, and describes them in ways that are incredibly disparaging and very, very uncomfortable to read. And it's yeah, it's it's kind of working out: is that Conrad, or is that um, something of the time that he's writing into, or actually is that? Um, the character. Is that Dukes? Is that Dukes? <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, and it's, yeah, it's, I think it's quite good to be made to feel uncomfortable mm. when you're reading things mm. and challenged and to have to make, have to pose those questions. Yeah. Because um, yeah. what's comparable is the pilgrims in the Patna in Lord Jim, right. where there's, uh, there's this very rusty old ship which is being used for the, for pilgrimage, for, yeah. to take people to mm. Mecca. Yeah. And the ship obviously isn't, shouldn't really be at sea. Uh, but it's it's packed full of people, and there aren't mm. enough lifeboats for the number of people on board the ship. Um, but they're all kind of the crew then abandon ship and leaves them. And again, this was based on a real, on a historical event where, as in the novel, to spoil the story a bit, um, the crew, the European crew deserted the ship, turned up at the at Singapore, I think, and announced that this ship had dis had sunk. Unfortunately, it hadn't sunk; it had arrived before them. Unfortunately, <laughs> like, that's a very <laughs> sorry <laughs> from that perspective. <laughs> you know, in your introduction, yeah. you were like a pressing writer in mm. relation to globalization. Yeah. Can you say a bit, or perhaps the panel, mm. say a bit more about that? And why is why is Conrad relevant today in terms of that discourse of ours? Yeah. Focus? Could I throw the more general question about why is he relevant today to everybody, and then I'll come back to globalization yeah. if nobody else? Yeah. Mm. Why is Conrad relevant today if he's relevant today? Brexit, anyone? <laughs> I just, everything that I was reading, just I kept just thinking, this is, the, you know, Brexit. The, the whole political situation that we're in at the moment feels incredibly pertinent to his work. And I think, you know, you were saying, it's almost like he, you know, he, he, he's sort of foretelling things in the future. Um, I think Amy Foster particularly struck a note for me um, in terms of this uh, alienation that, you know, initially the um, the guy, I can't remember the character's name. Yes, yeah. he's he's sort of welcomed and, and part of the community, but then when he starts to overstep the, you know, the societal kind of lines, he's very much um, shunned. And it, it was just so pertinent to the situation, I think, in 2016, mm. 2017, mm. For, from my perspective. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Well, that's that's the scene you you, you mentioned yeah. the, the the moment before. Like the, the the ship full of Islamic refugees is found uh, yeah. in the ocean, yeah. and yeah. somebody has to be blamed for 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 what happened. We have done inquest, and the, the corporation want to say that the the, the, the company that owned the ship mm. wants that we had nothing to do with mm. that. It's a human error, and yeah, so like true. you can make a story, a, a movie like that yeah. in 2017 with contemporary. Yeah. Dress people yeah. and almost the same dialogues, almost the same plot. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a story that could yeah. happen tomorrow. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Lord Jim is a very good example of how 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 eternal. So so far, it's contract is irrelevant. I would say that I'm not happy about that. I would I would mm -hmm. I would perhaps some future generation will live in a world when they can see the, it's a, it's an old rubbish. It's it's yeah, not nothing to develop. It's not relevant any longer. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, For for me, he is very. Important because he he um, touches emotions and uh, 
uh, for example, <coughs> like um, I was thinking about writing my my story, and I felt provoked. It it doesn't happen that often that a writer who uh, published his books uh, almost a uh, hundred years ago, mm-hmm. it still plays on emotions. And I had plenty of moments when when I felt. Uh, annoyed and insulted you know even this lack of voice i am not yes now you mentioned Wojtek that i'm of course i'm not sure whether he really didn't give voices because he was constructed like this or he wanted to signalize that you know we have a problem in this society i don't know but i i keep, I keep thinking right now but also there was this image of of the city uh, in uh, heart of, the heart of darkness mm-hmm. Probably it was Brussels. Uh, it was Brussels. It was Brussels. Yes. He couldn't, he couldn't say that for legal reasons. But it's not named. It's not named. It's, it's not, not named. named. Yeah. No, it's yeah. just, he, but he couldn't for legal reasons. <laughs> exactly. So because the, Leopold would not have been happy. <laughs> <laughs> so then uh, I talked with my with my friends about this um, particular description, uh, and I talked from my point of view, a, a Pole who who came there uh, twelve years ago. Uh, and I still remember uh, our communist cities, uh, which were very dark and very uh, gray at the time. Now they are completely the opposite because they are full of colors and noises and, and uh, advertising adver- advertisements. But uh, for me, Brussels was was uh, a very cozy place, uh, small because it's smaller uh, than than Warsaw. Uh, and when I came to Brussels, I had a completely different um, image of, of the city than in Conrad, uh, in Conrad's Heart of Darkness. So that's why at the beginning I felt offended, you know, like, like my Brussels, it's not my Brussels, how he dared to describe it like this. But then I talked to my friends and they are of Congolese roots mm-hmm. and they see Brussels differently, mm-hmm. for example, because mm-hmm. they see the city as a, as a city of, of huge buildings mm-hmm. built on uh, this procedure that yeah. Conrad described yeah. and for them Brussels is probably not that cozy and, mm. and not that mm. friendly and mm. uh, they are at least I'm white uh, so yeah. <laughs> my perception is different and yeah. uh, the perception of me is different but they have different uh, um, experience so that's why you know we even discussed this this fragment and I'm thinking yeah. you know it's a huge success for 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 a writer to to be discussed again uh, after mm-hmm. hundred years yeah absolutely yeah. yeah the situation in Brussels was that King Leopold was very keen to have an empire mm-hmm. and he when the Americans defeated the Spanish in the Philippines he wanted to buy the Philippines um, but they wouldn't sell it to him um, and what he then read was a book by a man called Money about the, what was called the Dutch system, which operates in Java. And the Dutch system in Java used um, enforced labor. And a kind of light went off in Leopold's head where he suddenly thought, yes, of course, that's how you can make money, mm-hmm. that you don't waste money on wages, you just enforce mm-hmm. labor. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was his vision that he, when he then went into the Congo, what he then set up, it was very much his a set of companies that he owned. It wasn't Belgium, it was actually Leopold. Mm-hmm. And he said this whole network of companies who part of what they were doing was kind of selling things to each other, which then inflated, built, which created kind of paper profits, but nevertheless mm-hmm. it was there. And the other thing they were doing was enforcing the local people to um, find, first of all, ivory, but then also rubber. And um, mm-hmm. I don't know, have you seen the Royal African Museum in... Brussels. I refused, frankly, because uh, there was there was there is a museum in Tervuren. Uh, yeah. When when I came there, it was about to be closed, and I was thinking I should probably see mm. it uh, from anthropological point of view. Yeah. But f- I didn't. I didn't. I, I I felt like I don't want to see it. And now yeah. it's uh, under uh, reconstruction. Yeah. So they invited a lot of um, people, also from diasporas. Um, <coughs> And um, they, they create something new, so we will see what's yeah. uh, what's the result. But yeah. uh, when when I came to Brussels, I wasn't very much aware of what really happened in in Congo. Mm. I mean, apart from uh, Conrad's uh, work, but then of course I, I talk, I, I read, and um, there is o- also a, a book um, by Adam Hochschild. exactly, yeah. Uh, yeah. Ghosts of uh, the King of the King Leopold, which is which is a very very. Mm disturbing book mm. and there is a kind of uh, Belgian answer to that book mm. uh, which is written by David van Rijbroek uh, mm. the Belgian author um, it's I translated it's translated it's published by mm. my publishing house uh, mm-hmm. it's called Congo mm-hmm. uh, and then um, 
it's a kind of Belgian, um, um, you know, answer yeah. to yeah. to very emotional book of of uh, ghosts of, uh, of, of sure. Leopolds. Yeah. Yeah. And um, it's not that David tries to uh, explain uh, mm. things, but uh, he concentrates on, on different matters. So, you know, mm. this is the generation, he's my, of my generation. Mm. So this is the generation of Belgian people that, um, uh, this is the fourth generation, fourth reaction, because mm. the first reaction in Belgium mm. on, colon, on, on, on the fact that Bel Belgium was a colonizer mm. was that they were proud of this. Mm. The second generation uh, was offended uh, that uh, actually independence independence happened in in uh, in Africa. So yeah. so Congo has yeah. been independent, and this generation was really offended. Like mm -hmm. why they are separating from us? We we we've done a lot of good things mm -hmm. like trains uh, or you know hospitals, Telegraphs. education, <laughs> yeah. and we, we really did. And then there was this generation. Um, who said, okay, guys, uh, we, we really did horrible things. Uh, the King Leopold's uh, people cut uh, hands yeah. uh, of, of, of uh, Congolese uh, uh, workers. To encourage them to work harder. Yes. Yeah. And this fourth generation, this is the generation mm. of the author of, of Congo, mm. they try to kind of find uh, the uh, balance yeah. between, mm. between all of this. So this mm. is interesting to see yeah. what is the... the yeah. um, because oh, the, the museum had a lot of objects which, from, from the Congo, mm -hmm. and they all had a label saying, from a defunct Congo village. But the village actually wasn't defunct until the Belgians went into it. Yeah. But it had this kind of mass of objects all from mm -hmm. defunct Congo villages. Mm -hmm. It has a, a plaque in there, which is a, a long panel about the um, honored servants of the various companies. And it includes names like Rom and Hodister, who've been suggested as models for courts because of the kind of things they were doing in but there they're being honoured on this um, mm -hmm. plaque. And in the entrance hall, there was a, stat a huge, more than life-size statue of um, Congolese people being rescued from the slave traders by the, by the Belgians. Because that was the argument that, one of the arguments Leopold was using was that he was protecting the Congolese protecting. people from <laughs> Arab slave traders. Yes. But if you tried to go, go against his argument, you had lots of lawyers who would um, sue the life out of you and make your life not worth living. Yes. <laughs> uh, so the things that you couldn't couldn't say. And it was exposed by Edie Morell, who was based in Liverpool, who mm -hmm. was an accountant, who was doing the books for the various companies who were dealing with the Congo. Mm -hmm. And as an accountant, he thought there's something wrong with these books because there was all this stuff coming out and all that was going in was guns. And the, the kind of penny dropped fairly quickly about what was actually going on there, that this wasn't, this wasn't to do with trade. So in 1901, Morel then founded this um, society to expose what was going on in the Congo and That's started agitating about that. There was a celebration of it a few years ago, was there? It West Kirby or? Mm, I missed that. There was a monument or a memory of it. Morel. Yeah. There was even a, an exhibition in, in Brussels recently, I think two years ago or three years ago, called uh, Propaganda. It, it was yeah. called Notre Congo. Uh, it was not, not Congo, which means our Congo. Uh, so mm. the title gives yeah. also the hint. <laughs> uh, it, was, yeah. it was about the propaganda and they really had the, 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 the whole uh, machine uh, after, after machinery after this because they, they had postcards and mm. Um, the whole system, school system in Belgium, uh, even now, uh, is very uh, old-fashioned in the sense that they still don't talk uh, about about the colonization. So it's a, it's a really it's swept under the carpet even now, mm. and uh, mm. and in in school. Um, my, my kids uh, uh, went to, to Belgian school, so what they learned about uh, Congo and Belgium is that uh, the Leopold was a big explorer, and this is <laughs> the, the, the historical truth that uh, Belgian kids uh, get from school. So some of them go further, and they study themselves. Uh, yeah, and this is the reality. Yes, I just come back to. I was going to just come back to Brian's question for a second. Um, one of the things that Conrad did from 1914 onwards was he then started um, engaging in, in writing essays in favour of Polish national of, of Polish nationalism because of oh, a Polish nation which he wanted to emerge from the First World War. So he was he was working with people to 
he writes to the Foreign Office and things like that about the need for a Polish nation to emerge at, at the end of the war. Um, but what he also writes about is about, he has an important essay called, where he talks about the, this is his response to the 1905, to 1905 um, developments. And he talks about competing national, two visions of Europe. One is competing nationalisms. And he sees that the, the danger of um, German nationalism and Russian nationalism and a future which is going to be very unstable and violent. Or the alternative that he argues for is for a frontierless Europe. And that's what he's advocating in 1916 as, as the only solution to an unstable future of competing nationalisms. So you, sorry, you had a question. Yeah, it's just <coughs> talking about the Congo. Uh, there's a connection between this area and Belgium, mm. he says, because Leopold was raping, basically, mm. the Congo, mm. and he was execute people and torture. Mm. But he also had contracts with Unilever or Lever Brothers on the will, yeah. who made this great thing about being a supporter of the arts. Mm -hmm. And he was actually making his money yeah. in conjunction with Leopold. He had contracts to enable him, his company, to grow palm oil right. trees. Yeah. And mm. then there was forced labour using local people with guns mm -hmm. to force other local people to go and do the very hard, yeah. hazardous work of yeah. collecting From palm oil. Yeah. And it's it, it ports, it's poured sunlight and yeah, ports, yeah. It, that, that aspect is forgotten mm. the connection between this area and Belgium mm. both combining mm. to exploit people in, in the Congo, Congo. Mm. yeah yeah uh, so I published a book recently have you, have you seen that book it's actually called you, you were referring to a book uh, called uh, the Ghosts Leopold so Ghosts that, um, so it was published about the very subject you were talking about it's called Lord Oliver Hume's Ghosts Ah. Um, it's a it's a reduction of a much larger work by a Belgian historian about mm. about um, Lord Hume's uh, connections with uh, mm. Congo. He also has a town named after himself, um, like they like yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. in the Congo. Because the exploration was being done by Stanley, mm -hmm. but. Um, mm -hmm. Leopold was funding Stanley yes. to yes. explore. Yes. Mm -hmm. And Stanley's method of exploration was exploration by warfare, is what he described it as. And he described the Gatling gun as being the great um, benefit of civilization, because mm -hmm. that's what he used in order to travel up and down the, in his exploration of Africa. He, he relied quite a lot on mm -hmm. um, machine guns. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't know how, how, how writing a literature uh, is being taught in, in England, but in, in, in Poland it's like the teacher is giving you the only, the only reading which is acceptable, or how, how should you understand the, the, the book <laughs> that you have just read, and you shouldn't have a dissident voice, it's, it's, I mean you could, but it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not a good, uh, so, so in schools we, we, we are taught a very, very different contract actually than the one we're talking right now about, that his books are about the honor of a seaman uh, and, and how you should, you should be faithful to. And this, this, this uh, orthodox reading is, 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 is giving one of, one of the essays yeah. in, in, in this topic, and I, I disagreed in, in my <laughs> secondary school, I disagree today, so, so, so we do have a very big, huge tradition of reading Conrad, but completely differently than the rest of the world. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I, 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 I did read, and I was in Warsaw a couple of weeks ago, and I had a collected volume of um, Conrad studies from Poland. Mm -hmm. And one of the essays was about Conrad as an apostate, because mm -hmm. he left Poland and didn't. Mm -hmm. But using the word, the whole essay was about using that concept of apostasy mm -hmm. in relation to having left Poland. I don't mm -hmm. know how that would strike you as a... <laughs> As a judgment on Conrad. No, no, no. So <laughs> the part of this, the part of this uh, orthodox reading is that he never did it spiritually because it's uh, you can. Well, if you try really hard, you could find everywhere that it's actually about the Polish question, even if it's not. So, 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 so the, 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 the this canonic reading is uh, is that he was you know explaining the the world about how 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 sad our ancestors felt when there was no Poland on map. So. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's the kind of new reading. I mean, <laughs> but <laughs> really, like, you won't find it in the heart of darkness if somebody wouldn't point your finger. Look, look, this is about the poor fate of Poland. Like, you would have, you have to 
really work really hard to find it. Yeah. Yes. But I think in our program, in our school program, we had Lord Jim only, not mm. not the Heart of Darkness. Mm -hmm. It was Lord Jim, and I remember it was such a boring lesson that and we i have to sorry i have to make coming out uh, i didn't read lord jim at that time and i i got really a bad note in at school and then i le read it by myself and it was really hard different <laughs> so, but it was very boring uh, lesson it was really <laughs> not worth it was that about the partner being like conrad leaving poland was that the re reason reading you were being given because that was one of the 1930s readings of Lord Jim in Poland, was that it was an allegory about Conrad leaving, having left Poland. Sorry? Uh, uh, that Jim jumping off the Patna was, yes. was read as an allegory of Conrad jumping out of, leaving Poland behind. Uh -huh. <laughs> what I'd like to then is thank the, all three of you uh, for your reading and thank for you. your conversation this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yes.